Hey everybody, Peter Grosso, Pocket Pete. Real quick before we get into this podcast with the great Dave Fox. Got to tell you a quick story um, and apologize if you didn't get the best from me from this podcast. Um, little did I know, while I was doing this podcast, I had the flu. I, this is this podcast was shot back in January. And uh, while we were talking, I was wondering why the heat was off. I was wondering why Dave didn't look like he was as cold as I was. Um, and as soon as it was over, I was shivering. I kind of rushed Dave out and I found a Santa suit from December, put it on, drove, had a drive to a house with a lockbox on the door. Uh, so I was on someone's lawn dressed up like Santa Claus, um, and somehow drove home nearly delirious and walked in my door wearing a Santa suit in late January, my wife ripped it off me thinking I was going to uh, traumatize the children. Uh, I went up to bed and a series of, I uh, lost my voice and just a series of uh, things happened right after that. So um, forgive me if this isn't the best uh, podcast I've ever done, uh, but Dave definitely held his weight and I'm sorry that I didn't give him my best, but check it out. It's still great. And Dave is wonderful. See you soon. Ready? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pocket Pete Podcast number three. I am so excited. Uh, I'm here with Dave Fox. The, the The purpose of the podcast is exactly the re the reason why I want Dave here. It, this this podcast is about the most interesting people that that do things that. The, the rest of the world needs to kind of learn about and learn like the ins and outs of. So, hello, Dave. Welcome. How are you, Pete? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. How are you? Good. So, you're a professional poker player. Yes. Right. And in, I, can I say underground? How would you know? How would you describe I, what you know the the circles that you that you play in? And then I want to talk about how you how you got here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would say the bulk of my play these days is probably, you know, in the underground circuit, um, which is in a lot of ways how I started, and it's sort of come full circle in a lot of ways. In the in the in-between, I did a lot of traveling. I, uh, I did the whole touring thing around the country. I was on the road three weeks a month for a number of years, playing at, you know, every casino there is, uh, tournaments all over the place, and... I uh, that ran its course for me, and I uh, came back to my roots, being on Long Island here. Why did it run its course? It ran its course because it was just grueling and exhausting, or were there other? It was it was a variety of reasons. When I when I started doing it, I uh, we had I had a good network of friends from college that we were all you know very close with, and I spent a lot of time with you know around New York. And when I started doing the whole touring thing. One of my biggest concerns was having some disconnect from them, and there was going to be a need to replace that void for me. And I was very fortunate to find some good people in my early years of being on the tour through the poker world who I became pretty close with, and the majority of which I'm still pretty close with today. And at the juncture that it was time for me to move on for different reasons, whether it be that they got jobs, whether they had children or got married or didn't enjoy the game anymore. A lot of them had moved on from the game. So a lot of what made being on tour fun was no longer there and it made it less fun for me. And then it made it just about the poker. And while I still enjoy being deep in a poker tournament and get the thrill and get the adrenaline rush, Every bit as much today that I had then in the few instances in which I play them these days, I didn't have that same rush going into them or in the earlier parts of them. And the overall frustrations and the letdowns that you continue to have when you play poker tournaments because your expected result is to fail. You know, 10% of the field cashes. So, you know, baseball, you know, you, know, you, you succeed if you fail 7 out of 10 times. In this, you need to, you know, accept that nine out of ten times, if you're an average player, you're not even going to cash. And the times in which you cash, you feel worse than the times you don't. 
because it means that you're that much closer towards you know hitting a big score and having the real success and playing that on an everyday basis constantly having to deal with that letdown constantly having to deal with the emotions and I put my guts into those things when I play them not everyone does a lot of people are just very flippant about it they don't care they're either playing with someone else's money or you know it, it, you know just very carefree attitude I put like my heart and soul into it when I play it and continuously having to deal with that defeat was more important and, and more overwhelming than the prospects or the possibilities of the joy of the payoff of when you get the win. And once it starts to get to that point, just like I think it does for probably professional athletes, you know it's time for a change. Yeah. And Would you say, so, I mean, you were a winning player. You were making more, I mean, making more money than you were losing, but like you're saying, the constant defeat is just grinding emotionally. Yeah. That yeah. even though you're, you may be putting more money in your pocket at the end of the quarter, even uh, even even still, as I play cash today, predominantly for for the bulk of my playing, you still have to be able to accept. And you know, I try to explain this to to regular people who don't gamble for a living. You know, going to work and spending thirty, forty, fifty hours in a week, you know, at your profession, and coming back with less money than you started the week with, is a very unique dynamic that a lot of people can't accept. In cash. I usually don't go too long w without seeing the positives come through. In tournaments, you can go months playing absolutely perfectly, doing everything optimally and correct, and not have the result. And you know that, and you have to accept it. And I did for many years. But once a lot of friends moved on from it, and I hit a certain point, I was like, you know, it's it, this isn't for me anymore. I'm ready. I'm ready for the next phase. So I'll still play them every now and again. I still go out to Vegas for WSOP for the end and always go play the main event because I always get the juices flowing for that. I, I like some of the mixed game tournaments they have out there. I like some of the Omaha events they have out there. And that was also part of the reason I transitioned. Hold'em had become boring for me. And I moved on to Omaha. It was a more enjoyable game. It made me think more. There was more creativity behind it. And, you know, I was I just I just was looking looking for something different. I've never, I've never been somebody who has been able to stay too long with one thing without feeling like I need to move on to the next thing. I've stayed with poker a lot longer than I ever thought I was going to or ever thought I would, longer than I have with probably a lot of things. There's been a lot of things I've really enjoyed about it. Well, let's take a step back. Let's figure out, I want to, I want to hear how you got there. Um, so can you talk about your upbringing or your childhood? Like, where, where, where were you born? I was born, uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, and we, we lived on we lived out there for a little bit. We lived in Texas for like six months, I think, when I was two years old. Then we came back here, and my folks bought a house in, in Corum, and that's where I was brought up and raised. I went to Longwood High School. I uh, was uh, heavily involved in USY through North Shore, and, uh, and North Shore Jewish Center was my synagogue. I had a, you know, a lot of a lot of friends that I met through that. Um, Did your uh, parents gamble? No. Well, yes and no. My mom... My mom, not at all. She, you know, the extent of her gambling was maybe like five times in her life putting like a quarter or two in a slot machine, you know, at, at the very, very most. My dad has always played cards, but he's played like, you know, five cent, ten cent, like, you know, like with his friends, you know, like just a very like super low key where the big winner in the night like even these days when he plays now, if someone wins thirty dollars, it's like it's, a big night. it's an enormous result. <laughs> um, and just to put that in perspective, what's a good night for you if, uh, playing a cash game? These days, a, a, a good night, a really a good night, night, a night yeah. that I feel like very good about. Yeah, and equal to the thirty dollars for your dad, um, what would a night? What would a night for you be? Fifteen thousand plus. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of thirties. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 uh it's definitely different. Right. They, whenever I'm uh, heading out, you know, like like I'll, I'll be over there occasionally when he has his game going with uh, you know I'm by the house and I'll see him with his poker buddies and they're like oh have a good night and I'm like and you know they they get a laugh because they're just sitting there you know raising raising nickels and dimes and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's but is that what you <coughs> is that what you learned the game? I learned it from my father. Yeah, okay. he, when I was uh, eight years old, he taught me he taught me seven card stud. That was okay. the first the first poker that I that I learned. And 
then when I got uh, older, my my closest friend, uh, my buddy Chad, who I've known since I was eight years old, he became an options trader for Susquehanna. He went to Drexel, traded options there, and they had to learn 200 hours of poker. And he was trying to get me into trading, and I had a lot of other people are trying to get me into trading, and so he was working with me and kind of teaching me poker also. As, as so they were teaching you per poker to help you help understand options trading. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it was uh, something that that you know a, a lot of people wanted me to get into. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a lawyer. You know, I just I loved all the the Perry Mason shows and the, the Columbo's and the crime detective stuff and whatnot. I wanted to be a defense attorney. I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And I went to American University down in D.C. I, I knew I wanted to be in D.C. most likely. And I, a few months in, was pretty confident that it wasn't going to be for me. I, uh, I worked as a paralegal a year after being in school in a law office for a bit. And when I was with those those people down in college, I remember it was, uh, it was 94, and Bill, ha uh, Bill Clinton was doing a speech on Haiti, and they were, like, all juiced up. They're like, oh, get the pizza, get the beer, like, Clinton's got a speech tonight at Haiti, whatever, and I was like, well, like, who are these people? Like, this is not my speed, and they were just, it almost seemed like they just wanted to, like, talk cool and, and feel like they were in the know, and it just had a very, like, fake plastic feel to it, and it just wasn't what I wanted. And the more I learned about it, you know, you, you find out that the trial law and what you saw on TV as a kid growing up, it's not real. That doesn't happen. Everything is litigated. There's no, you know, big, dramatic, 12 right. angry men, you know, courtroom drama scene and whatnot. So it just wasn't going to be my scene. The, the, the suit and tie thing, the 9 to 5, none of that worked for the way that my mind worked or the way that I thought about the world or how I wanted to be living my life. So I... Uh, I moved on, and I, I got involved in film and TV. I um, I loved writing, always loved writing, since I was young. Did a, did it in a bunch of different forums, and during that year away at school, and when I came home from school after the first year, because it didn't work out so well for me in that first year, I did a ton of just watching old movies, going to the library, watching everything, old Bogart and. It, you know, you name it, and I got really, really into it. So I, I changed uh, when I went back to school. My course of direction, I got involved in film and theater. I was doing um, playwriting. I was doing technical production. Just everything you could. What did you did you want to be on TV? Did you want to be? No, no. I wanted to. I wanted to write. I wanted to write and direct more than anything else. That was that was the area that I was pursuing. And I got out of school, came up to New York back in 99. I went to New York Film Academy, finished a program over there, and I started working in the business. I, I started, you know, ground, ground level up, PA, production assistant, you know, just working on TV shows, independent films. I did work on Law & Order. I did work on Sex and the City. I did work on The Wire. I worked on a number of big feature films. Um, I did uh, one of the Spider Mans. They they used my car in it because oh, it was cool. like so beat up. I had this like totally beat up red Camry that was like just in terrible shape, and they needed a car on Lexington <laughs> Avenue. That was exactly what they were looking for when I was working on the set. So, but yeah, I did that for for a number of years, and I met a guy on one of the sets who took a liking to me, and he hired me for. Uh, for an assistant editor job with his uh, multimedia uh, site, which was called BoxingRanks.com. I was always very big in the sports, loved sports, wasn't very athletic, played some sports in high school, but wasn't particularly good at playing them, but I was a huge fan ever since I was 10 years old and the Mets won the World Series in 86. I was completely hooked beyond belief. And this was like a combination of everything for me. It was going to allow me to do multimedia production while having the ability to write, while having the ability to do something in a sports arena. He was trying to create a like a kind of college football top 25 ranking system. And we were working with uh, Elliot Spitzer and John McCain at the time. And we were trying to kind of legitimize the industry. What were they doing? 
Were they, were they sponsoring? Were they sponsoring we were, or tr actually trying to do legislation? We, we, we were um, doing a lot of different uh, interviews with retired boxers, current boxers, promoters, industry people, and yeah, they were trying to get legislat legislation to get this to, to become legitimized and give it like kind of like a govern, govern body sort of feel to it. There is, you know, they're, they want to make it good again. I mean, boxing it became so corrupt over the years. And they also were looking for ways, the same way that the NFL has over the last couple of years, to try to improve upon the lifestyles and the health of these boxers, both as younger and, and older, because of all the complications they have from, from the injuries, and bring more information to it. And they felt like if they could legitimize it this way, that that would be a way of helping them in that way. So we were doing little documentaries on them. We were covering all the fights. We were doing interviews with families. We were just lots of like little little bit things, articles now and again. I was working with um, the the senior editor who was working above above me and was a partner with my, my guy Lou Gordon was Joe Hamill, who was uh, Pete Pete Hamill's brother. Pete Hamill, I don't know if you know him. He he did he's a very famous newspaper writer. He did uh, a number of books. He did the Drinking Life. Um, he, he wrote for the Post for many years, and um, his brother Joe passed away. Uh, he he was super talented, but just you know a mess. He he worked with us on that, and the guy who was backing it, the guy who had all the money in it, was Howard Soraka, who was the lawyer who took down Crazy Eddie, hmm. and he had a ton of money from dot com, so he put it into this, and you know it was it was an interesting experience. I met a lot of cool people, a lot of you know fun anecdotes from that time period, but when dot com went up in smoke, so did the company. He, he couldn't put the money into it anymore. It went belly up, and when I went back to look for all of my contacts that I had developed in the, you know, independent film world and TV and whatnot, you know, a lot of them dried up also. The money just went out of the whole industry, really, and... I wasn't able to resurrect. I was pretty down, you know. I, I it was like I was I was for a year. I was just like this is like year two thousand. This was like two thousand three ish range, probably. You know, two thousand three, two thousand four. When when this, you know, kind of departure happened, may, maybe two thousand two around that around that time. And I, uh, you know, I was out of work didn't really know what I was gonna do I you know I like I was like had I was like not able to like resurrect where I had been and and I didn't know how to start over I knew I still wanted to write I knew I still wanted to direct I knew I still wanted to make my own films and I was like you know the best pathway for me to do this is to, to make more money and you know how am I gonna do that and so I started working for a family friend doing real estate title closings but it was really more job than it was a career path and became a notary and did that for a stretch and I started messing around in very very low stakes online poker and live poker um, on Long Island I was going to private clubs so this was um, the era after moneymaker yes you know and then poker became the yeah. boom it was right in the wheelhouse when it was like starting to take off you know moneymaker had his thing it, you know ESPN started broadcasting everything with whole cards uh, rounders came out. It was like the combination, you know, right. poker stars, everything sort of like connecting, you know, and all the stars were aligning all at once. And it always interested me, you know, it, it combined a lot of things that were appealing to me. I, I, I had a, always had a pension and an interest in psychology. I've always had a interest in statistics and numbers. Like I said, I was huge sports fan growing up. I mean, my friends would like quiz me when I was a little kid on like the top 10 leaders in every baseball statistical category. And I would like know the numbers to the, to the, you know, penny of what they all were. So numbers were always, you know, math was always interesting and, uh, competitiveness. Just so did you jump in to the game and learn it in the game or did you like study? Did you, I, did you, I, did I, you I, buy I, any books? I did, did it all. I bought, I bought every book there was to buy. Um, I've always, you know, I was a big reader when I was younger. I wasn't reading in my early 20s because, you know, late, you know, college years, I was just partying. Right. And, no, not in that But now we got space. something that's interesting. And now I'm back where I'm like, okay, yeah. I've got to focus on something I wanted to do, and I couldn't get enough. You know, I bought every book there was to buy, every, you know, Harrington, Sklansky, Brunson, etc. I did, you know, I read it all, and I played 
hundreds of hours of like just like five dollar tournaments, nonstop free rolls on all the different online poker sites to get experience there. Uh, Were you doing? Because I was, I played a lot during that time too, mm -hmm. and there was a time I actually got injured and I was home for a while. Where like I was playing online and it got to where I was playing five dollar tournaments, but stacking them. And at some point, I was playing like twenty tournaments oh, yeah. at a time. Oh yeah. So, like, did you get into that? Like, the... yeah, I did, I did, um, but still, just very small stakes, right. you know. And then, you know, had some money from what the notary stuff that I was doing, and and you know, earning money through that and playing cards, you know, on the side. And I started playing more. I mean, I was doing, I was driving out to Brooklyn, you know, and going to games at like eight p.m., playing till like seven in the morning with my buddy, playing like one two games, and and driving back at like seven in the morning, like same night. We used to go play in you know, the, the Russian outfit games on Coney Island and Avenue P. And we were like the court jesters for these guys. They got these like hardcore, legit, like Russian mobsters in a one-two hold'em game. They'd have like $20,000 in front of them and each their own like individual bottle of like, you know, Grey Goose and, you know, their girls on the side. And, you know, we'd come with like two, three hundred dollars <laughs> and we would fold every single hand for like an hour and a half playing like the biggest and it's super tight. And then we would find a good hand. We'd go in. The whole table would call right. us, you know, trying to crack us. We'd win. They wouldn't care. They'd high five us. Right. We were like their entertainment. Um, and then, but that was a lot of money for you guys. Yeah. Right? Like you were, yeah, was, you were driving it, home an extra 200 bucks. You were, you were fired up. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, kind of just built it up through that. I started playing little local tournaments around here. Did How, did Why well did it start them. in Brooklyn? Because just, I know there were probably 30 games between where you left your house in Corum. Yeah. By the time you got to and Brooklyn. I, and, then, and then I started playing in them. Um, I, a guy I became friends with... Uh, through Fantasy Sports League, uh, he, we, he, my, my buddy S S Scott, you know, ran this Fantasy Sports League back in 99, I got in it for, I was in it for a few years, and this guy Adam became a close friend of mine, um, Scott had put like an ad, like on, you know, Craigslist, like looking for someone to join our league, because that's how you did it then, because it wasn't as right. popular, and this guy was like a substitute school teacher, and he joined in, and we just clicked, we became friends. He lived in Brooklyn at the time, and he knew about some of these games, you know, and, and he was like, I would, like, crash at his house, you know, and, and we just we just started playing them, and the games seemed like they were better than the games around here at the time. Now, as time went along, I found plenty of good games around here also. Right. But it must have been to, surreal just being around the Russian mob, and, yeah. like, that had to have its own entertainment value. Yeah, of course. It was, you know, it was intimidating but exciting at the same time. Did you see sure. anything... Like any anything there that is worth chatting about, like in the games, any um, with these Russian fellas, it, they were caricatures of exactly what you would expect. Okay, you, you know whatever stereotype or, or 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 you know typical thing that you would anticipate or what you would see in the Rounders movie, they were those guys. You know, like I mean, nothing ever really bad happened in front of us. You know, they were. Uh, they were they were fun. They were they were charismatic. They were like jovial. It was a kind of a raucous thing. Like it was a good time atmosphere. Now, they probably did a lot of <laughs> horrific things, <Sure. laughs> not in front of us. Right, but right. I didn't see them. You know, as far as we were concerned, and what you know, and like you know, my my parents are like, are you insane? Like, what are you doing? Like, when all I was like, mine, you don't get it. Like, they're cool. Like, they're, it's not mm -hmm. a big deal. You know, so. It just it, were they terrified in your choices in that time period? Yes, because <laughs> yeah. I guess it sounds like you were telling them like what you were doing. Yeah, you know, so like you uh, obviously you were still living at home. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I, I I was actually living in the city. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, because I was doing the closing, so went out for a while. And then I came home just because I wasn't doing well money wise, and I'm like, mm -hmm. come home, you'll try to figure it out, you'll work, through, you know, you know, work it out, and then, you know, get yourself back together. And I, uh, you know, I was always pretty open with them, but I mean, I'm this Jewish guy from Long Island, like, I, you know, I went to AU, I was supposed to like go practice law, I wasn't right. supposed to be like gambling in like the Russian mob underground, <laughs> right. you know, for for my career path. 
I'm sure your mom was terrified. Was your dad slightly proud? Uh, like, he, yeah, he like, <laughs> yeah. He was he was torn between <laughs> horrified and, 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 and proud for sure. And and you know it, it became a little bit better for them as they started to see that I was taking it more seriously and taking it like a job. So I still was doing the the title closing stuff. And um, a buddy of mine uh, from school had a engagement party, and you know we're, we're all getting bombed there, and and we're in the pool and. Somehow I wound up, we were playing pool basketball, and I wound up riding a keg <laughs> while in the pool, and uh, I hurt my knee, and I, I, I hurt it like pretty badly, and I, I was not able to drive for about three and a half weeks, so I couldn't, couldn't go to any closings. I was just home, and I was like, I, you know, I'm like twiddling my thumbs, like boredom, and so I just started playing more online poker, and I was playing a few tournaments, and then... I had a hit one day where uh, I won two tournaments for, uh, there were like $11 buy-ins on Poker Stars, and I hit one for 11000 and one for 9000 both on the same day. Nice. And now all of a sudden I had twenty grand, you know, and I was like, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. Like, like, it's time, you know, I put my time in, I've studied the game, I, I feel pretty good, I have a bankroll to work with, I think I want to give this a go. So did you take the twenty grand out of Poker Stars? I did. Or did you say, and play it live, or did you... I did. Did you... I, I 100% kept, I, I, or I, I, did you... I left, I, I, left, yeah. I left, like, a thousand bucks in there. But uh, but you really, like, you were putting yourself all in yeah. live. Yeah, you know? yeah, I wanted to play the live game, because I didn't, you know, part of the reason... Why I learned poker is I had friends who wanted to get me into trading, and part of the reason I never wanted to be a trader is I didn't want to sit in front of a computer screen. I like being around people. I right. enjoy people. People are interesting to me. That's what interests me. You know, I mean, numbers are interesting, math's interesting, but people will always be the most interesting thing to me in the whole world. And I wanted the human contact, so live poker was always going to be the arena I was going to pursue. So I had the opposite feeling. I played the when I got like I said when I got hurt. I played probably. 80 hours a week in these games and I loved it and I loved problem solving and and I you know I I was I'm not saying I was good but I was I understood the game and I really enjoyed right the problem solving and most of the people but after a while the same complaints the same lack of personal responsibility and 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 like the same like hey I, you know if it wasn't for whatever I would be the I would win it drained me. Yeah. Where I couldn't sit and hear the same complaints for hours and hours and hours from the same people. And I decided I will never be, like, not that I could be, but that I would never be a professional poker player because of that ne constant negativity. Well, like, there's so much, com you know, fun and, like, but, like, every time someone lost a pot, it was a speech and, like, it was exhausting to me I was, mentally. I was a pretty calm guy, you know, ha have been am and continue to be for the better part of my life you gotta really get me going to uh to get me riled up and i remember i was playing one of these games in brooklyn um not with the those guys at the time but with one of the kids who ran the game was the son of one of these guys so he was no one himself his father was uh, and we were playing with a bunch of other like random people and that atmosphere was very much there you know what you're describing that kind of negativity and the and the complaining about the bad beats and and this was early on when I didn't have a great understanding of how often that happens I wasn't a professional at the time I was still kind of making my way in the game and I lost a hand and this guy was needling me and he got me all razzed up and he'd just been beating on me like game after game and he was a terrible player this kid uh, Sheldon, who was the son of one of these, like, you know, Russian mobster dudes. And I took my chips, I had, you know, a stack of chips, you know, 20, 20 high, and I took the whole stack, and I, I reached back and I whizzed it at his head, like, as hard as I could, trying to hit him. And it went, like, right by his head. The room was dead silent for 30 seconds. Like, I mean, you know, like I said, the kid's not someone, but his dad is. Right. I, I was Probably trying to hurt him. Yeah. I was yeah. completely out of control of my emotions. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You know, it was, it was actually a very good thing that happened for me because I didn't like it. I mean, one of the reasons why I don't exhibit a lot of anger or show a lot of frustration outwardly with poker, with beats in life is... I feel like you're you're showing some degree of weakness, and and you know I don't want people to know that I'm feeling that way. It's not because I don't get frustrated if I don't take a if I take a beat or, be, or I lose a hand. I'm a human being. We all do. Mm -hmm. No one's impervious to that. 
but you know, as a competitor, I don't want my opponent to know that I'm flustered. You know, because like I know if I'm on the other side of that and I see someone who's flustered, like that's the person that I'm gonna go after. And and right. you know, you you think that you know you can get them. And and so I don't. I, I didn't like the way it made me feel. I didn't like the way I acted. And I was like, you got to get a handle on this. And did that? Did he punch you in the face? No. <laughs> no, it was it was like it was like dead silent. I'm telling you, the room like you hear a pin drop for like a solid minute, and then I was like, I'm gonna go, and no one said anything. You know, like it was just like an unsaid thing. And I did play again that game, and I saw him and the next time. I shook his hand. He's like, it's all good. You know, because it was like just like one of those things we weren't we weren't gonna talk about it anymore. Right. But I learned a valuable lesson from it, and um, I had one other experience like that once I went on the tour. Um, which was pretty funny. Uh, it, I'll, I'll just say it very quickly. I was um, now at this point. This is this is like a couple years into my playing career, and I was starting to like have some success in tournaments and meet some important people. There's this guy Eric Haber, who was actually from Long Island himself. He was his name was online with what, Sheets. What year is this? This was like 2005. So like when you first had that twenty thousand dollars. Yes. Uh, like and and what year was that? So that was in like two thousand four ish range, I think. So then I went two thousand five. Did you have a direct run up of that? I, of I that, did. Of I did. So I took, I took that money. I started playing in uh, local uh, mm -hmm. Long Island and New York clubs. I also started going to Atlantic City, playing a lot of the daily tournaments there to try to get better at tournaments. Um, just get more experience in, in, you know, not just like the local field, trying to play mm -hmm. against people who are of a better skill level, and I just kept running it up. And uh, you feel like I, you feel like the people in Atlantic City had a better skill level, because I always thought the opposite. Like the people that will not see their wife. From I wanted, I wanted to play in a casino. Yeah, you yeah. know, it was more like, like in my mind, there was more. Uh, of a realness to playing in the casino than right. there was in the local club. Now, in reality, a lot of really good players came out of these local clubs and, right. a, a, and a lot of talent. And you're right, they probably were in a lot of ways better than a lot of people. But at my, in my mind at the time, my perception was not that it was that way. And I was like, okay, like it's one thing for me to beat the twenty dollar, you know, nightly clubs on right, the right, islands. Right. Another thing for me to go succeed in hundred dollar, hundred fifty dollar tournaments in right. Atlantic. So City. tournaments were your focus at this point. It, it was it was where my mind was headed. You know, if I was at that time like kind of looking at sort of building a little bit of a career in it, and that was where where like all of the hoopla was in poker right. at that right. time. It wasn't in cash. Um, I always made money in cash, I always did well in cash, but tournaments were a different type of excitement, there was a different kind of buzz, there was a different allure, and it was like how you could kind of like make a way for yourself. At this point, what kind of poker player are you? Are you a Dan Harrington? Are that, you... was, that was the player who I, who I actually tried to emulate as much as anyone. Of all the books that I read, I got the most out of his books. His approach, his style was the one that I tried to employ the most. It's funny that you, you I completely you well, said I, that. You know, I read his books too, and I that was the, I read a lot of the books too, and that was the one that clicked and made it as clear to me, and actually made it so simple that I could teach my wife at a charity tournament. I felt the same way. And say, here's what you want to do, just don't do anything but this. It, it, and, just, it just registered. Yeah. It just, for, I, don't, you know, I don't know if I can entirely capture the reasons why, but for, for sure, as a player, I respected the way he... I, you know, selective aggression, but right. not like a complete lunatic. You know, I wasn't looking to be like a Gus Hansen type. Right. I, he was. He was the guy, and then those books really did. Right. You know, connect with me. The first time I read about the squeeze play. Yeah. I was blown away. Yeah. I remember, I remember they. Oh, I get it. And I. And I, I like. And, and I implemented yeah. that stuff. Yeah. I. I took it. You know, everyone says you got to learn on the fly. There's no better way to learn through experience, and that's true. And for some people, reading a book probably isn't going to help at all, but. I always learned really well from from reading. They, you know, I, I was, you know, visual learner, seeing the words, being yeah. able to, you know. There's a difference between it seeing it and then having someone tell you that does it why they do it. Yes, and that, and that completely. That's huge to like. Okay, I see what he did. I don't. I'm happy to try to figure out why he did myself. But if he tells me, I probably I probably have the best perspective. Yeah. If something else happens, I can adjust based on that thought process. That's right. right. Not on that event. So, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, so anyway, my, my buddy Adam, who I played these, you know, Brooklyn things with, 
when we started going and doing a lot of these tournaments, we would go partners. Sometimes we would go quarter. Sometimes we would go full. Like, like just chop whatever our result is. We played, you know, straight up. But like, hey, you know, so you both are playing in the tournament. Hundred, you know, yeah. So we go and play this Brigada tournament, and it was a five hundred dollar tournament. It was the first tournament that we ever played at that size at that time. You know, we didn't have a huge bankroll. You know, we're working with whatever twenty thousand, twenty five, whatever it is. Right, right. And his wife. You know, was never gonna let us play in anything that was more than like three hundred bucks. You know, like like I mean, obviously she could make a decision for me, but she could make one for him, and we kind right. of just did you, everything yeah, together. We, it, yeah. we drove to all the events together and whatnot, and so we decided to play this tournament. It just we saw the field; it looked like it was really good. We were there for the previous buy-ins, which was smaller before that, but we we're still in in Brigada, and we didn't tell her we were gonna play, and. Uh, he uh, he hits the tournament. He, he you know he chops it four ways for like forty seven thousand, and this was the biggest thing that we'd done you know by far between the two of us at any point. I call her you know then they they didn't stop the tournament you know at, at like eleven p.m. back then. They just ran it all the way through. So it's like eight in the morning the next day. You know we she'd been right. playing for for two days straight. And I called her at like 8 in the morning. I'm like, I got good news and I got bad news. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, the bad news is we uh, we broke your rule and we played a $500 tournament. And she's ranting and raving and screaming and yelling and whatnot. And she's like, how could you do it? And I was like, listen, before you get all mad, the good news is he won 47000 <laughs> And she was like, oh my God, you know, whatever. And they right. bought their first car and then good like, that was it. We were on yeah. our way, you know, like, and it just like, then he had another one. So you so, split so that. He, so we split it. So right. he was actually the one who was having the big tournament success early on before, before I was. And, um, did you feel any tension? Yes. Okay. A hundred percent. From yourself or from him? Like, uh, both. Like, okay. Both. You know, more for myself. He yeah. was, he was. I knew it was bothering him, but he was good about not saying that it was bothering him, but yeah. I knew that it was, so I felt it, and it's like, you know, it, it's a very results-oriented business, you know, like, right. uh, you know, John Travolta, um, some, some time after he did uh, Pulp Fiction, was uh, doing an interview and like you know I've heard this in different capacities but when he said it it resonated for me the whole film thing and he was like you know um, I've come this whole arc in my career you know I started you know Grease Saturday Night you know Fever was big hit star and then had those like years in between Welcome Back Connor where you I was just, Welcome Back <laughs> of course <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you know the, the whole long stretch where he just did nothing you know and then you know Full Circle Pulp Fiction kind of brought him back and got him famous again thank you to Tarantino and he's like the one thing I've come to realize is I was never as good when they thought I was great you know as I thought I was and I was never as bad when they thought I was terrible, you know, as, right. as I thought or they said that I was. And it, it's, it's like that for really almost everything, you know, and it's certainly like that way in poker. You know, when you're winning in poker, everyone thinks that you're like some superstar and you're doing everything mm -hmm. perfect. And when you're losing in poker, everyone's like, oh, you know, like they're, they're, they're not good. They're, they, they, they game passed them by. And it's somewhere in between. It's always somewhere in between, especially with tournaments where there's so much luck and variance. You're, 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 you know, I did way worse in some of the years that I was so much better of a poker player than I did in my best year of 2007 when I was nowhere near the player that I became several years later. You know, right. just just happened to catch fire at the right time. But in that early part, before I had that big success, he was uh, he was bringing home the bread and I wasn't. And it was definitely starting away on us until I, you know, finally connected. And, um, you know, once I did, I, I got real hot and uh, it, it took off from there. So you had a run of tournament... Play, like high placings and yeah, wins. yeah. I I uh, my I, I played a satellite in two thousand six to get into the ten k WPT Foxwoods um, final. Uh, you know, in, in November, and I'd never played in a ten k WPT at that time. And I'd taken a couple of shots to get in in previous stretches and never gotten through. And I was never going to buy in for ten thousand. It was way too much. Right, and. I won my seat. I played the satellite, and I—I uh, I mean, I'll never forget. It. Like I—I I couldn't. I called my uh, my parents to tell them I won my seat, and 
I, I actually couldn't talk for like the first minute I was on the phone with him. My voice just went dry because I was so excited. I was like, I had just had such a good feeling about it and I really felt like I was going to make a run. And I did. I finished in uh, 16th out of like 800 people in that, nice. you know, for like whatever it was, 50,000 or something. And um, that awesome. was that was kind of the lead into my my. And are you partnering on that one too? Like it was we that? were, yeah, yeah. But I just so you're, like, you're you're pulling your weight. Yeah, and I I, I I I learned a lot in that tournament. I learned a lot from the people that I played with, watching you know what they were doing, you know, high level pros going deep in an event. And it elevated, you know, my play, and then I just took it's off the next totally year. It's a totally different experience at that level, right? I mean, yeah. Not, I mean, the skill and like time. You no, have it's not, time. It's, it's not even. It's not even the same universe. Yeah, I you know. I played in. I I I placed ninth in uh, the Borgata main event, the five hundred buy, and so I won like fifteen thousand. Okay. So I bought the thirty five hundred dollar seat. Mm -hmm. And I never had so much fun. I honestly wouldn't care if the game was for a dollar, because the play was so good and you could like problem yeah. solve. You had so much time. Oh, the, the, it was the, the the feeling that you get. You know, I don't I don't play tournament poker anymore. Mm -hmm. I was explaining to you, uh, you know, when we talked, you know, before that that you know it came to a point where it had run its course for me, and a lot of the frustration with it was just more than I wanted to do it anymore. But then, you know. Now and forever on, the feeling you get when you're deep in a poker tournament, it's, it's an adrenaline rush that's like no other. You know, the way that you see a professional athlete talk about like what it's like to like get to the Super Bowl and you see like right. George Kittle, like lifelong dream. What You have that feeling when you're deep in a poker tournament. It's just, you know, and it's, the money is exciting, of course. The prospects of being able to win that kind of money for playing a game, just a game. You know, right. like like we're playing Monopoly, right. but we can win hundreds of thousands of dollars for playing poker. Right. You know, it's a crazy notion. That's exciting, but but that isn't what gets the juices flowing. You know, the the what you're talking about, the problem solving, the competitiveness, just trying to like outman you know this person when you're there. You know, like I, for me, like I have a hard time like even like sitting in my chair like when we're at that point. Right. You know, and the more you do it, you. Uh, you start to gain some composure, and, and, and but internally, it's still all it's still all going. Yeah, and you're, and you're just thinking about, you know, what if, you know, if one more. You got a million. You, know, you got a million things going yeah. in there. It's head. all sort of like a lottery ticket. Like you know, like you're holding it; it hasn't hit yet. Yeah, and you're just thinking about like, if I did, you know. Call my mom. Do my this. You know, like you know, if I and, made and it. that really is more in the in between time. Right. You know, at the table, you know, you, you learn to just not think about any of that stuff. Right. Because you can't. You know, like while you're playing, you just want to think about what's the best thing for me to do in right. this hand, in this, in this moment. moment. You know, yeah. to to help me do well in this in this event. You know, when the day ends and it's day four is over and you're going into the final day with ten people left and you're, you know, having drinks afterwards or you're waiting waking up the next morning that's when the butterflies are coming through that's right. when you start thinking about what you're talking about but at the table you i mean i don't know how it is for everyone but for me like i try to just let all my focus and attention be towards like the game the yeah. hand and, and yeah. the strategy of that yeah. moment and I, I don't know how you, uh, but i just appreciated it i appreciated the moment yeah you know and no you, i mean you have to because it, it doesn't it doesn't happen all the time right. but then when i lost and like like my friends couldn't figure out why i was unhappy about it's, it's a gut punch. losing it's a gut punch like you, you got fifteen thousand dollars i go it's i know it's great but well, when i you know, try like, to describe the, the world series of poker out of vegas to people and what the whole atmosphere is out there you know it's like Ninety nine and a half percent of the people there are miserable. <laughs> half percent are are the ones who got hot that summer, are winning all the right. bracelets and having all the glory, and everything's clicking and doing well. And everyone else is miserable. I started a few years ago, not going for the entire time. For a bunch of years, I went for the whole six weeks. A few wow. years back, I made a decision. I didn't want to lose that much of my summer anymore. Um, and uh, I think you know, if someone had a. a um, important event going on that I had to be home for, whether it be a wedding or whatnot. I enjoyed being home for Father's Day. I just didn't want to give up that much. So I get out there a few weeks into June, 
missing a chunk of it, and I see all the people I know, which is the best part of the whole scene still, then and now, you know, for me, is just seeing all the, the faces of the people that you like, even the people that you don't like, you know, there's just so many interesting characters in the poker world, and just everyone had just this, like, look of disgust and misery on their face, right. and I'm like, I am so happy I have not been here for the last three <laughs> weeks, and the people who are the most upset are not the people, you know, because everyone has it in their, in their mind that they're the only one. They're the only one who's having a rough go. Everyone else is doing so well around them because you're reading about the successes. You're not reading about all the failures and miseries that everyone's having. And, you know, the people who are the most upset are the people who are winning. The, the worst I ever felt and the time that I knew that I was going to need to move on from playing tournament poker three weeks a row on, you know, you know, traveling was the best World Series that I ever had in Vegas. I, um, I I cashed like nine nine of the Hold'em events. Uh, I didn't play a ton of events. I was making day two in everything I played. I was final two tabling numerous events, and I make a deep run in the main. It was my deepest run in the main ever. I, I finished um, like 190th. I was deep on day five. I started day five at one of the hardest tables I've ever played at in my whole life. It was like me and eight other top pros. You know, I can give you names. They may or may not mean something to people. Um, my, uh, one yeah, my Give us some names. Oh, we had, uh, we had Kenny Tran there. We had Alex Jacob. We had Tom Dwan. We had Jonathan Little. We had this guy, is a Canadian guy, Ludovic Lakai was very big. Um, the, uh, I'm missing a couple, okay. of them, but that, 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 yeah. it was it was it was star studded. Kyle Balker was there also. Was one of my closest friends today. Actually, we were we were friends. You know, we were, we were pretty good friends at the time. Not as close as we are today. He's one of my closest friends from poker at this juncture. But he uh, he was at that table. And I was like, how am I at this table for day five of the main event? Like, you're supposed to be with, like, a bunch of, like, amateur people. Like, this is miserable. And I do well there. I, I, I chip up from, like, 400000 to, like, 750000 We break tables, and I'm, like, on top of the world. You know, like, like, this is awesome. I just, like, got through this, like, table of death. And I came out, like, well ahead of where I started. Like, I'm feeling so confident and so good. And I get to this new table, and there was this Croatian dude who literally played 27 consecutive hands at the table. <laughs> and he's got, like, the Jeffrey Lissandro type hat. He's got, like, his whole shirt unbuttoned with all his chest hair sticking out and all his jewelry. And he's, like, an Omaha player. He's not a Holden player. He barely knows what he's doing. And he's just, like, watching his chip stack float like an accordion between, like, 200,000 and 2.7 million chips. And... I'm like, this is my guy. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, double through him and whatnot. And he's just losing chips to everybody. And I take two beats to him, and lose all my chips, and I'm out of the tournament. And it was such a long, exhausting summer. I had so many opportunities for big, like five hundred to a million dollar plus scores. And my net result from the whole summer is like plus, like. I don't know, maybe sixty thousand or so. You know, for all these deep runs that I've had. Right. Which I mean, you're still not a band six weeks. Sounds great yeah. from a money standpoint, but 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 it, it, it not from a competitive. Standpoint. I I left. I, I bust the tournament. Every person from the table gets up to me and and walks over and shakes my hand and like says sorry. This guy tried to shake my hand and beat me. I couldn't even shake his hand. And I'm not that way. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty cordial with people, you know, in these events. And I, I didn't even want to look at him. I was so dejected. My buddy's Adam's wife was uh, on the rail. He was playing another tournament. She was watching. And we, um, you know, I had, like, PP poker stuff that uh, Eric Siegel, Eric Pools, was, was doing, you know, at the time. I had all the sponsor things on, and I'd just take it off and like, <laughs> throw it in the garbage, throw my hat in the garbage, and I don't say a word, like, walking up to the, you know, Rio, you know, hotel room. We get up there, I smash the vending machine with my hand. I just, like, I'm miserable. It's the only time I ever cried in my entire life from playing cards. I always had perspective on what it is, right. and I was just so emotionally drained, and I was like, like, what, what am I doing, you know, like, like, this is, this is what, like, this guy gets to keep playing, I put my, like, heart and soul and my guts into this thing, and this guy played like a complete buffoon, and he gets to keep playing and make a run in this thing, and I'm sitting here, like, tearing my lungs out, like, 
you know, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like it's not, it, this is not what I want to, what, what I want to be doing. And so that was a transitional moment for you. Yeah, it was, it really was, you know, maybe just think about tournament poker in a whole different way. Everything from that summer was like, I'm a, you know, I'm a good player. There's people who are better than me. Um, better than a lot of people, but there's plenty of people who are better than I am. But I'm, I consider myself a winning player in the upper echelon of players at that juncture. And I'm having deep run after deep run after deep run. And I wasn't able to like get over the hump. It's like, that isn't going to happen every year. There's going to be years where you're not going to make any runs at all. Right. If I'm not able to make it happen then, like, like when when can you make it happen you know and then like this is from someone who's had i've had you know i've had a decent amount of tournament success in my life and had some good wins but not that one to like just take me totally totally you know over the edge right is that so um i don't know so your six weeks in a tournament the whole world is going by for six weeks, and you're like almost like in a fish tank. Right? Yeah, I don't know anything like, happening in the world. When I yeah. when I was out in Vegas during that stretch, and that was part of why I didn't want to go as many either. There would be like huge news events. My my friends from non poker world would like talk about it months later, and I'd be like, "What are you talking about?" They're like, "You're kidding, right?" And I'd be like, "No, what do you mean?" And it would be things that were like as big as anything that could be happening in the world, and I right. had no I had no idea. Like yeah. no, I mean. You couldn't put it any better in a fish tank. Like, you know, I'm in a casino, not seeing the light of day, playing 16 hours a day, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, nonstop. It's, uh, yeah. it's a wild experience. Yeah, do you feel like separated from like family? And like, do you feel like, like, very like much. is that, um, let me just check this, is that like, you're in a fish tank essentially for six weeks? Yeah. Is that, like, there's got to be an emotional draining on that. family and friends. Yeah, and like just yeah, and, that, and, that was, and that was a big part of it too. You know, like, like I, I, I didn't like that anymore. You know, for a while it was cool and it was exciting and whatnot. But, but I started feeling like every time I was going out there and being out there that long, like it was, it was getting close to the main event. I would like feel this like need to start calling like family and friends I hadn't talked to, like feeling guilty right, about right. not having like seen them or not having spoken to them. And I was like. I don't, I don't, you know, I hadn't learned how to be able to manage that. I hadn't learned how to be able to do both concurrently, you know, and, and some people can. Um, I wasn't able to, and so I found the best way to be able to access that was to not put myself in that position anymore. So th that was one of the catalysts that stopped you from yeah. going on these yeah, tournament yeah, tours? Yeah, that and, and um, you know, for a, a number of years... The tournament trail and the tour was as fun a place as you could find. You know, there was all kinds of crazy prop bets that would happen all the time amongst everybody. We would all do, you know, lavish dinners and crazy gambling ventures, and you know, f tons of partying. It was a very fraternal nature to the whole scene, and and you know, everyone had their own little crews and cliques, and then sometimes different crews would like all intermingle together, and it was it was beyond the poker, beyond, you know, the it was just fun. And a lot of those guys moved on for different reasons. Uh, you know, family obligations, um, quit, didn't like the game anymore, got jobs, got married, had kids, whatever it may be. And losing that, you know, changed the whole dynamic and the feel of the whole thing. You know, because my game plan was never to play forever. It was never, I wasn't looking to be a lifelong poker player. I'm still not looking to be a lifelong poker player. It's hard to get out, you know, when you, when you stop and you think about, you know, how could I work in the real world and put in these hours and try to, like, earn dollars that to a normal person is very good money, but in, in the world in which I've come to know, it's like, I, you know, I would have to work, like, six months to make what I can make possibly in a couple of weeks or, or a couple of days of things right. like really came together it's it's hard to like put yourself back into that headspace and so you know I don't want to play forever there's other things I want to do in my life there's other things I want to accomplish but I wasn't able to find the exit that was like a way of helping me to at least start that transition um, if I wasn't going to be on tour and I was home I could at least start to think about moving in a little bit different direction and I have and I haven't in some ways, you know, since since making that break from playing tournaments all the time to playing cash. 
I'm still in the world of poker, but I'm not as much in the in the scene the way that I was. Then. So, what's your schedule, poker schedule, like now? How how many nights do you play? These days, I play, I play. Uh, I would say an average of probably, uh, well, let's say three four nights a week. There's there's night never almost never less than two. There's days or nights that I might play five. Sometimes I play online. Um, online is different today than it was then, but there's a lot of private games that you can play online. And I play uh, a few nights a week live. You know, usually th um, uh, maybe, uh, it depends. Depends on a week. Let's say three to three to four nights a week on on average. And I play nights. I've always been. A vampire. Uh, what's it like? To, I mean, what's it like to not see the sun for four or five days? <laughs> like, is that you know? It's good and it's bad. Do you I get mean, bouts of depression from it? Do you get? I, I there's there's times that I do. Yeah, I mean, there's times that it's not that it's not the best. Um, you know, on one hand, I've never been a morning guy ever since since I was a young kid. I mean, there could be a nuclear holocaust going off next to me, and once I'm asleep, I'm just not waking up. I, I missed like senior year of high school. I think I missed uh, phys physics, uh, which was first period, like seventy eight times. Yeah. And I had to, you know, go in and get like take a test, and I got a good score on the test. But I had to like have a meeting with the principal to get my high school diploma, even though I had very good grades throughout all of high school. Because your max amount of allowances uh, uh, attendance, you know, missed was like twenty seven. And I blew through that, you know, so, like, I mean, waking up was never my forte, and going to sleep late was always something I did. I was always someone who wanted to see what was going to happen next. You know, I didn't want to miss anything. I wanted to, like, like be the last man standing at the end of the night to recapture whatever it was that, that transpired. Right. Um, so, on one hand, I don't like waking up early in the morning, but on the other hand, on days that I do happen to wake up during the day these days, and I have some kind of built in things into my schedule now to sort of force it so that I don't get into a cycle of just never seeing the daylight. You know, the week kind of resets itself for me at the beginning of the week and I'm like a little bit of a normal human being from like Monday to, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday and then I'm like kind of an abnormal human being until the weekend and then I start to regroup and reset myself over the weekend and then it just kind of cycles back. When I do wake up and you know, see the daylight, I feel a little bit better about things. I definitely feel more productive and more connected and more communicative with the outside world. Um, that said, the games that I play in that are the best, that are the ones that I'm involved in right now, are night games. That's just when they are. Uh, people. When you say night game, what time do they start? They start, you know, usually between 7 30, 8 30 or so, and they run, I would say, on average, till about 5 30 in the morning. Um, Who's in these games? Are there. Like, are these people with jobs the and majority, have to be working the, the, the in the GDM? The majority of the people that I play with these days are. Uh, are like private business owners, uh, guys who own their own companies and kind of make their own rules and their own schedules. They still work, they still have to be up and do jobs, but they kind of run the show, they don't have anybody to report to. If they're not doing that, then they're, you know, younger guys who either, you know, are like I was, you know, 15 years ago, trying to kind of make their way in this whole thing, or, or have retail type jobs with sort of oddball hour schedules that they can play at night and, and not necessarily have to wake up, worry about waking up in the morning or they don't necessarily work. It's very few people who work a traditional Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, um, even if they're very, very successful, which a lot of them are. Is it hard to have a diet, a good diet? Extremely hard. Because any game I've been in, it's pizza, Chinese food, pizza, Chinese food, it's there. They're, they're, yeah, it's, you know, they're, it's, they're, it's, very, it's very difficult. You have to, the only way you can really live healthy if you're, doing these games is if you're either just being really diligent in all the days that you're not playing, um, but that isn't even really a solution for someone like me who plays four days a week. Someone who plays once, maybe twice a week, they can do that. For someone like me, in order to be healthy, you really have to plan it out. I had um, one of the games I was playing in a few years ago, one of the girls uh, who plays, who had been playing there, she was uh, meal prepping for me. 
And that was the best thing ever because she would be at all the games and she would bring the meals to the game. She would bring me several days worth of meals and I would just have those to cover me and I wouldn't have to worry about it. I didn't have to do anything. It was like mostly vegan food and I was like very healthy. I lost like 35 pounds. My cholesterol was nice and low. I felt amazing during that time. And, you know, there's been different stretches where trying to get back to that. One of the big things actually that goes on in the poker community is weight loss bets. That's, uh, right. My my buddy's involved in a very big one right now, and they're for some enormous amounts of money sometimes. I mean, you know, tens of thousands of dollars they can be for, and they're crazy. I mean, the stuff that some pe- these guys do is nuts. Like, I, I mean, my buddy juiced for doing nothing but you know juice the juice drinks, no food for like sixty seven straight days, Jeez. Um, and he lost like you know. Dude. 55 did pounds he win? in a couple of months. He won. Okay, yeah, good for him. He did. That'd <laughs> be a sad loss. I mean, nothing. Like, that's yeah. all he did. I mean, people will do whatever they have to, because, you know, part of it is a competitive thing, too, you know, but, like, ultimately, those are not solutions, because they, you know, everyone just puts the weight back on, you know, right. it's, uh, yeah, right now, what I'm in the midst of, I, you know, I had a few of my friends just did some weight loss bets, and I'm, you know, trying to, I was doing really well uh, about a year and a half ago, and I... You know, over the last year year or so, I've kind of just gotten back into bad habits with it. So one of my New Year's resolutions is to get back on track with that. And I'm trying to do it not with a bet because theoretically, you know, somewhere down the road, there's not going to be these people around to make these crazy off-the-wall right. bets with to motivate me. Right. And I want to try to learn And also to these bets these are about speed, not about longevity. Exactly. So, you and, know, it'll yeah, long run. The only way I want to make one of those types of bets, and my buddy and I did this for a stretch, and that's when I was doing my best, was we made a, a keep it off bet with it also. Right. Where we had to, like, weigh in once a month after the the initial way and thing came to like show that we were keeping on track, and if at any point we gained back half or more of the weight, we have one month to lose, to get back to our number, or we lost the whole amount of the bet altogether. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, they got like you said, tons of heavy Italian food, uh, heavy you know Chinese, all the junk food imaginable. You know, booze if you want it. Yeah, I mean, there's a. Uh, Nothing but gluttony available there, and and it's just easy to pick on, especially when you're, you know, losing for pots for you know tens of thousands right. of dollars. It's like, okay, what's the immediate way to make me feel better in this moment? Right. So, so tell me about the game. What's what's the volume for the game that you're in? You, you, you I, like I, in? I generally play games that are in the um, you're, you're you know buying in for around uh, you know probably an average of twenty five hundred three thousand dollars for an initial buy in and. Um, the stakes are probably in like the uh, probably around the same nature of like I don't know like a big five ten or maybe a medium ten twenty five game. Um, they vary sometimes from game to game, but that's that's like a an an average amount of what they wind up being in for, and uh, you know a, a decent night. If you you know like I'll go into a night if I w- if I'm gonna win four or five thousand, I'm happy with that. Um, but there's there's usually not a night in most of these games where there's not at least one or two people that are losing somewhere between you know ten to twenty thousand ish range. Um, not a ton of people doing that, but there's almost never a night where there's not at least one or two that's doing that either on the plus side or the minus side. Have you seen guys totally drain their life savings? <sighs> to like, like seen yep. guys just go from something like wealth to. Uh, I mean, I've seen, I've seen, you know, numerous guys lose, you know, over six figures in in, in a session, um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, and guys that that, I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of money for anybody. It's not a lot of money for you know some big athlete or an entertainer, but for any kind of halfway normal person, it's a lot. Right. And I've seen guys lose that that are nowhere near in the position to be able to lose it because. You get caught up in the the madness of the night, and you know chips are flying, and you, you, you know you don't even you know what's happened. It's a blur. It's it happens so fast. And this is sometimes on credit. Yeah, yeah. So like they they're losing a hundred thousand dollars, but they have not contributed a hundred thousand dollars. That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. That's this a is, tough bill to pay. Not, it's not like uh, the <laughs> movies where they're showing up with a briefcase with a hundred thousand and they're right. handing it over for every single buy it. Right. So, it's just that the house knows you, trusts you. Yeah. And that's 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 what you're going off of, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and 
it, it can it can get hairy sometimes for sure you know and then people are like what what happened you know and yeah. uh sometimes it'll get settled sometimes it get, a deal gets made it doesn't always get settled in its entirety but yeah i mean people can go off the rails it, it's it's for sure something that, that has happened does happen and will continue to happen have you gone to zero since that 20 or have you since you took that 20k yeah yeah i i i had i had a stretch in between where where i dipped down just because of poor bankroll management poor lifestyle choices um it's uh it's it's pretty common in in the industry to uh to to hit zero at some point in between for any number of different reasons um you know we're, we're you know you, you don't know how to value money like that when you've a never had it like that before and you didn't work for it the way that like a guy did who started his business when he was 17 and you know was right. grueling and working every single day 20 hours a day it's it's not the same thing you know you come into it so fast you don't you don't really have a true comprehension of how to handle it and I certainly didn't and every young guy that I see these days that hits a big tournament and gets a big score I, if I know them in any way or at all I try to give them some of my, you know, little like life lessons and uh, and advices, and maybe they listen, maybe they don't. But the biggest one I give them is take a chunk of it, you know, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't matter the amount. Let's just say in percentages, twenty five percent of it, and just take it and put it somewhere with someone who you trust, whether it's your your wife, your sibling, your parent, whoever it is. Just give it to them, let them hold it, let them put it somewhere. It doesn't exist. It isn't yours. You don't own it anymore. You're going to need it at some point, someday for some reason, whether it's because you go busto, because some sort of tragedy happens, some kind of project comes up, an opportunity, whatever it is, there's going to be something you're going to need this for. And you don't need all the money you just want now. You didn't have it yet yesterday. You don't need it all today. You still have more than enough to do your thing with, more than enough to operate with, and secondly, don't go nuts. Just because you won this doesn't mean you should just go start firing into the biggest and highest buy-ins and highest stakes of everything you can do all in one shot. Keep it where you were before this. You want to take an occasional shot to step out and do something a little lavish? No problem. But don't go nuts. Because if you do, and you don't put this money away, it will be gone more often than not. I've seen it happen, I don't know, 90% of the time with people who it's happened with, if they haven't had that kind of money before, that type of success. And so, you know, I try to, I try to warn everybody. And, you know, the other thing is, like, you'll see a lot of guys that weren't doing this for a living or weren't doing it professionally or frequently and they'll get a hit like that and they're like oh I want to I want to go pro and I'm like look you want to go pro go pro it's fine but like understand what it is and think twice about it and if they don't have anything else going that's one thing but I try really hard to advise people that have a good job not to walk away from that job and that career because this isn't for everyone. It's not for most. It's not even for the people who it is for. You know, there's a lot of things about it that are cool and fun and exciting. There's plenty of perks to it, but there's plenty of negatives too. Like like anything in life, there's pros and cons. And you have to be a very specific type of person to accept, you know, going into a week, going into a month, and losing all the money that you put your hours into work for and coming out with less than you had when you started that week or that month. And not just from a, a financial standpoint, there's a big mental battle. There's huge mental swings that you're gonna fight within yourself of having to deal with like the ups and the downs that are invariably going to happen for everybody. And you have to almost have like a Teflon suit and, and, and really try to keep yourself as even keel as humanly possible. And that's not easy for, for most. It's not easy even for people who do this all the time and have been doing it for a long time. It's certainly not easy for, for regular people. So, you know, it's it's fun. It's interesting. You should mess around with it now and again. But as far as people trying to look to get into it as a thing to do as a career or long term, 
there's very few people who I'd say it's, it's, it's suited for. Yeah. How, have you been in any raids or any robberies? So, I have been super fortunate. I've been playing in private games for, you know, the better part of 15 years, you know, at different junctures and different places. Um, some very upscale places and some very unsavory places. And I have had a combination of good fortune on my side and good sense. I, I was always very uh, conscientious when I played in the unsavory locations to not keep specific playing patterns. You know, and I also was pretty tapped in to whether or not certain games were under heat. I had some connections and some insights, you know, into that. And so if I ever got wind of it, I just stayed away. So I've been able to sort of play like an amazing game of, uh, you know, catch me if you can, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and avoid these things. I, I've had some very, very real lucky near misses where like it was a game I was going to you know or a game I just left where it happened after I left or you know so and that's just dumb right. luck right. Um, but I know a bunch of people who've had it all happen to and uh, it's not it's it's not fun it's not not a good experience for them and so I really these days make it a point to do my best to not play in games where where um, that's most likely to happen and for the most part Raids aren't going to happen where house games are. They tend to happen more in industrial locations and commercial locations, and I don't play in those uh, primarily for that reason. Because I'm at a point in my career, in my life, where I just I don't need that. It doesn't mean it can't happen where I'm at, but you know the games that I play in have good security uh, cameras. They have some people watching, and you know the cops really aren't interested in it as long as you're not messing with neighbors. And as far as robberies, you're always at risk. There's always a possibility that could occur. But playing in games where the people are a little bit more upstanding, a little bit more civilized, makes it less likely because it doesn't attract the CD of an element. And so for the most part, I try to surround myself with that type of environment. It's not perfect. It doesn't mean that there's not some of these guys sometimes in some of the games that I'm playing in. But I was in a lot more games that had a lot more exposure in that when I was younger than I do now. Is there a life lesson in poker, in the game of poker? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of them. Is there one that I could name in, like, a way that just has, like, a kind of catch catchphrase to it? I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's tons. Um... I don't know how I would even begin to answer it in, in, in one sentence or, or in one thought on the spur of the moment. It's probably something I would have to think about more and almost write it as like an essay because <laughs> I've definitely learned a lot. Right. I've met a lot of interesting people and I've learned a ton about life in doing this. Um, but you know, to answer your question, is there a life lesson? I don't know if I can capture that. I've time. learned two things from poker that I express to people that are outside the game. One, you can you can do the right thing and still have bad things happen. It doesn't mean it wasn't the right thing. Yeah. And in the long term, good things will happen. And the game fundamentally is a, a lot about empathy and if you can have empathy and put yourself in someone else's shoes, you can advance yourself in the world. That's, those are two things I've taken out of the game, right or wrong, and have expressed them to you know the people around me that don't play. Yeah, I played. mean the, the the first thing the first thing is for sure right. I mean that's that's just clear cut. Like we're in the business of uh, of making good decisions. That's that's what we do. You know, like I, uh, you know, I never gotten real involved in casino games because they didn't they didn't interest me because they're they're antithetical to everything that I'm supposed to do, which is making bets with positive expectations, and theoretically. As long as you make good decisions, the result doesn't matter. You know, it might matter that hand, it might matter for that night or that week, but in general, you keep making good decisions over time and you'll come out on the plus side and come out ahead. So that's 100% correct. As far as the empathy thing, expand a little bit more. So, you have to make good decisions and you have to work with the assumption that you know what decisions your competitor's making. And are they, are they in the same frame of mind that you are? Are they... 
if you could put yourself into their shoes and try to think like they're thinking, then that empathy for them and their situation can be, in, in a sense, exploited. Yeah. But you have to like you have to be able to well, look at someone and, and say, in, I, in that regard, for I, sure. I'm taking on your feelings right now, and I, I, I think I know what you're thinking. I've always said to people, you know, like, I'll make a fold or I'll make a call, you know, with a hand that people are looking at, and they're like, how can you make that call with such a weak hand, or how can you make that fold with such a big hand? And I've always tried to express it's... You know, it's not. Like, it doesn't matter what your hand is. Your hand means nothing in poker. I mean, it means something in relative to what your opponent's hand is. But if you can get a good handle on what your opponent's hand is, then then your hand is only as good or as bad as what that opponent hand is, and you can play accordingly based on that. And your cards almost don't matter anymore, right? Because you're just kind of trying to capture what they're thinking or what they're, what's going on in their mind. One of the mistakes I made a lot of the times when I was younger was assuming that people were thinking the same way I was when I was doing this. And I would either give them too much credit or not, you know, for sort of thinking right. that way. And I was making decisions based on that when they, they just weren't on that level. So it's important to get a good handle of your opponent and the way they think, you know, in, in terms of are they thinking about it the way that you are or are they thinking about it in an elementary way to really have a sense of where they're at. But, yeah, I mean, that's that's always a big deal. And... You know, that was something that was always easy for me to do in life because I've tried to treat people that way in life. You know, I'm always trying to think of people's situations from where they've come from, you know, and not, I don't, I don't view myself as a judgmental person in that regard and understanding, a, a, you know, a person's background and path. And so being able to use that and apply that in poker is definitely something that's been an advantage for me. So, yeah, in that regard, I'd agree with you, yes. All right. Hey, Fox, I appreciate your, your insight and, and all these great stories. Guys, download the Pocket Pete app, listen to Dave Fox's exciting in-depth stories about being a poker professional, and don't forget, I help you buy and sell houses. So, give me a call. Talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs> we didn't even get into the DM.